important that whole thing you talked about the process that they need to understand like some of these pieces within the process are going to take time mm -hmm. and if you're in a hurry if we speed things along you're not going to get the kind of output um, or you know insights that you're really looking for from the work product now you can you can re re respond to the timing issue very easily and that's again setting up a process where there's con there's different phases and the fa and there are easy phases and there are a little bit more complex phases so you're constantly feeding the information that the client needs it's just done uh, in a in a staged way and they think wow this is great because I, yeah I did get a response within a week you know we I I worked with somebody who was doing a some reputation um, risk assessment work and we were using uh, social media so we were using Facebook and Twitter information and just overnight in during the pitch for the for the pitch we were able to show that when they ran a PR campaign they their reputation suffered which was really interesting so now all of a sudden they wanted to know can we do it now well we did it on a sample that was very small and so trying to do it in real time was going to take a little bit of time but we were able to walk them through what our process was and they were intrigued with it so in addition to like um, doing that, what you did, um, not only did you kind of educate them on the process, but you also gave them a little teaser. Exactly, exactly. You know, hey, look at what we can do for you. This is just a little tidbit right. and you can get more. Now I'm lucky. I've been working with people who are very, are machine learning experts, they're AI experts. And so they're really taking advantage of a lot of the, um, the software that's out there to, to do some really high end stuff. So, you know, that makes it really interesting. And all, all I have to do is pitch what the results are and the insights from the results. But somebody else is in the back room doing the work. So I like all the ins and outs you've given us around, you know, developing proposals. Another question I had for you, Joanna, is, you know, if you're, you're thinking about developing or creating a, a consulting firm, you know, should you do, you know, establish, you know, a LLC, a limited liability company or not? I think your state is going to rule on what that is. Uh, my feeling is that you really need to get legal advice. I absolutely believe in that. If you don't want to get sued, then uh, you really should talk to an attorney who can give you advice in your state for what's the best way to go. And I think that you should be as conserv conservative as possible. I think it's well worth the money that you'll spend to get the right advice, and you act on it from there. So can we, uh, let's just go back a little bit on um, talking about the proposals. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the most difficult for someone who's never done consulting before is how do you decide how much to charge in that proposal? <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on the work. Um, so if it's, it's project-based, I think there are a few things that you have to do. Again, as part of your branding exercise, you've positioned yourself. Part of that, in any business plan, there a bank is going to ask you or the small business association is going to ask you um, what is your potential revenue and you have to figure out what your value is now your value is generally uh, anything that you decide that you want to charge for your salary so let's talk about an independent contractor a sole proprietor it's your salary there has to be a profit right because you're not you're not in a nonprofit organization, right? So you want to make a profit and you want to cover any external expenses you might have. There might be travel and entertainment or there might be um, people you need to hire and you have to decide how you want to bill, that, bill for them. So those are the things you have to take into account and you need to think about that up front. In market research, many years ago, I think the market research standard was um, a third for... Uh, expenses, uh, a third for, uh, and those were out-of-pocket expenses, a third for people uh, who you needed to do the work, and then a third was profit. And that was in market research. So I always knew when I was in the market research business, I could always negotiate that one-third profit. But uh, you just have to figure out what profit you feel is reasonable and, uh, and then decide if it's a small project. Do you want to charge on an hourly rate or do you want to charge if it's long-term on a, uh, a day, day rate or monthly rate? 
And would you ever look at charging by like a project? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And is there... That's short term though. That's short term. Yeah. And it has a beginning. It has a middle. It has an end. I'm going to get this stuff done in a certain period of time. It's a project. And so, you know, how do you maintain and sustain your relationships with clients and peers to continue to grow in this area? So <laughs> I think the, the thing is that if you have developed a relationship with a, a client, with a person, um, you know how they like to communicate. So for me, most of my clients really love texting. And so we do texting and telephoning or texting and emailing or we never necessarily do in-person stuff. So I just text them, hey, how you doing? Anything going on? And I have a cadence of when I'm going to be out reaching out to people, and I just go through my list and do it that way. So you just make sure you do that to always stay top of mind? Just so that they know that I'm still alive. If you, A lot of times... <laughs> I'm well, old, but I'm not dead <laughs> yet. <laughs> I'm still alive. An example is um, when I, with my first consulting gig um, for this large company, I was working, I was putting in probably 60 to 80 hours a week trying to get a, a, a process set up. And I did that for a while. And it got to the point where I got very nervous that I was going to um, be out of a job, you know, and, and it would dry up and nobody knew I was, I was around. So that's why I went in and said, you either uh, let me cut my hours back so I can build my business or we come up with some other option. So um, I think that you need to think about that and you need to think about what do I need to do to reach out to people and uh, make sure that they know that I'm around so that when an opportunity comes up, they think about you. Because the one thing I know is human nature, that's my background, is to understand people. And human nature is if you're not in the moment, they don't remember you. So you just have to keep going after people who respect you and understand the passion that you can bring and want to work with you. But I think it's a interesting insight into if you are a sole proprietor or you're working with a group of people and you do have, you know, work in front of you and you have some clients where they, you know, they really rely on you that you can't get so focused on that one or two clients and not reach out to others and keep in touch because when that work finishes up, you, yeah. They may, as you said, right. you're not top of mind anymore right. and they forget about you. What do you do if you have gaps in projects? If you can't keep that continuous flow happening, how do you fill the gaps? So the first is going to be uh, how financially secure are you at that time? So I always may have made sure that I had enough money to cover my basic expenses. I need a place to live. I, I can't work out of my car and, you know, with the bed. I, my office cannot be the back seat of my car. Um, so I make, make sure I've got enough money. Um, I also, though, look at time as an downtime as an opportunity to do outreach. So the thing is, if you, again, if you're texting um, or you're doing something very uh, which may be small to you, it's actually you're still front of uh, top of mind, and it's a matter of calling somebody up and saying, "Hey, what's going on? Do you know anybody who's looking for for work?" And and I think you need to use it as as uh, uh, an opportunity to do the outreach. If you haven't set up your consulting practice to give yourself the time during the work day to reach out to potential clients or existing clients. Let's go back to the busier time when you're overwhelmed and you don't have those gaps to do the reach out and to maybe look for other work. When do you decide that, oh, wait a second, I need to bring people in. I'm now overwhelmed. I want to keep these clients happy. You know, have you subcontact before? And, and when do you decide you need to do that? That's something I always plan for. So I know what my limitations are, and I know what my strengths are. And so I think that it's very easy, especially if you're a sole proprietor, to take on too much work. So I always have a contingency plan 
of somebody who could be available to help me out. And they're usually slightly more junior people. So, you know, they're going to learn from it. And it takes some of the burden off of me and I can manage them. If you have somebody who's your peer or has more experience, there could be a conflict in the way you want to approach something. It's easier for, <laughs> for me to have somebody who has a little bit less experience and wants to learn. And years ago, I actually went to a couple of the colleges, the universities near me, and brought students in because I could manage them very, very closely, but they were doing all of the basic work and I didn't have to deal with it and I could really make sure that what they were doing was going to be good. But my reputation was on the line and I needed to be make, I needed to make sure that they were going to uh, deliver what I felt needed to be delivered. And since they personally were not delivering it to the client, I was, then I was comfortable with that. So that was me being a control freak. When we're talking about charging and setting up projects, you know, most of our viewers are probably talking, you know, thinking about like a firm for a profit firm. What about um, a non-for-profit firm or charity? Do you approach them in the same way? Yes. However, I ask a slightly different question. What I'll ask is, what's your budget? Because the budget will determine how much work you can do. And then you start to manage the expectation. So I think that that's the way I've always worked with nonprofits. And I've worked with quite a few of them in California. But it's, again, the question is, what's the budget? But I don't reduce, I I don't lower the standard. What I do is I change the type of work that I do. So if somebody, for example, let's say they want a market research study, right? And, and we know that if I have to go to the outside of market research study, let's just say they want to do focus groups, right? The market research study might cost them, I don't know, let's say $10,000 a group. What I would do is say, and if they wanted both the research study, I mean, the, uh, say focus groups, and they wanted the standard thing would be to do quantitative I might just do the focus groups and use my experience to help frame what I think um, uh, they're going to get, what, what more they can get from that information just because of my experience. So versus, it's ha- versus giving them the quantitative, which you I wouldn't, know won't, wouldn't fit in the wouldn't budget. Wouldn't fit in the budget, right. Okay, so you have to kind of make adjustments. You have as- to adjust, yeah. And they have to, you don't want to lower your, the quality of your work, right. but you, it also has to fit realistically mm-hmm. within mm-hmm. compensation mm-hmm. for you yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I do think it's a good point that understand the budget first. Yeah. So Joanna, um, as we kind of close out this one off session, just wondering, what do you, if, is there something like some key advice that you would give people before we kind of sign off? I think the first is uh, consulting as a sole proprietor and looking for a job, really have the same process. You need to know what your positioning is. You need to know what you're worth. Uh, You need to know what you can bring to the company. Uh, You need to be able to articulate why they want you. And I think you need to bring high energy. It's very easy for you to get depressed about not... Uh, having work coming in. Um, And I think that, especially initially, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to say no, and you have to be able to separate yourself from um, um, from the rejection. Right. So, so for me, it's been, I, I used to take it very personally. I felt that they were rejecting me, but then I realized they weren't rejecting, they were, what they were rejecting about me was the fact that I didn't have the right skill set to give them what they needed for the project or the, the long-term relationship. So as soon as I personally was able to divorce myself from that, it made it a lot easier. And so you, you, have, to be, you have to be willing to walk away. And just a quick question on that whole separation component. You know, because we're so used from a full-time perspective, you know, you're in the middle of everything, right? And then from the consultant side, you might not be in the middle of everything. How do you get over that angst of, I'm not in every friggin' meeting and I want to be? Um, again, it's a separation. I have a tendency of saying, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not in the meeting, that's okay. 
it's, I hate to say that, <laughs> I think it's probably because 